It's a cold and gloomy winter's day to be out here on the shores of Maine. Yeah, it is. Uh, not really a day for the beach. Mm. It looks downright, I don't know. Ominous? Ominous, yes. Mm. Ominous. You almost get the feeling like something bad is in the air. Hey, look out there. Look at the icy fog rolling across the water. Ooh, yeah. Okay, I'm a little freaked out now. I'm sure the islands of Harpswell, Maine are picture perfect in the summer, but right now, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Being here near dusk, I mean, it feels gloomy, like something bad could happen at any right? time. Yes, yes. So keep your eyes peeled on the water, Ray, okay. because we're looking for a ghost ship. And I hope for the sake of the people of Harpswell that we don't see it, because if we do, it means a local is going to die. We're in Maine, searching for the dead ship of Harpswell. Hello, I'm Jeff Belanger. And I'm Ray Osier. Welcome to episode 331 of the New England Legends podcast. We're on a mission to chronicle every legend in New England one story at a time. So many of our story leads come from you, so please reach out to us anytime through our website with your tales of ghosts, monsters, aliens, roadside oddities, true crime, and the just plain weird. We love hearing from you. Hey, quick announcement, Ray. Mm. Zombie Prom 2024 is coming back to Milford, Massachusetts on Saturday, February 17th. To benefit the Community Harvest Project in Grafton, Ray and I have been hosting this event for years. It's a ton of fun for a great cause. We had so much fun last year. Absolutely. Doing it again. Uh, it's the same weekend. So if you were there last year, plan on it again. You can check out our website for ticket information and hotel deals. And we'll get back to searching for the dead ship of Harpswell right after this quick word from our sponsor. Okay, Jeff, ghost ships always freak me out. <laughs> yeah, I get it. And we've covered a few of them before. Well, we've learned over the years that there's two kinds of ghost ships. Right. There's the physical ship. It's solid. You can touch it. Mm -hmm. But it has no living person aboard, yet it sails itself. Like the Mary Celeste we covered way back in episode 88. That's right. Then there's the other kind of ghost ship, a phantom ship that's seen and then vanishes. Like the ghost ship of New Haven Harbor we covered way back in episode 43. Right. We've actually covered several ghost ships over the years, um, both kinds. So is this one of the crewless kind or the phantom kind? Okay, so this one is a little of both. And they say it's a harbinger of death. If you spot the ship, it means someone in Harpswell is going to die. The legend even made it into one of John Greenleaf Whittier's poems way back in 1866. If you've been listening to us for a while, that's a name that you've heard before. Whittier covered many New England legends in his day, but he did it with poem form. He did. Yeah, that's him. A little more about Harpswell, Maine. The town is made up of a peninsula and more than 30 small islands. The town was incorporated in 1758 and grew on the back of farming, fishing, and shipbuilding. Author Harriet Beecher Stowe once called Harpswell home. No doubt the sea has been an integral part of life here for centuries. Folks have lived and died by the ocean, so it makes sense they'd keep a close eye on any signs the mighty Atlantic might have to offer. So, to find this ghost ship... Let's head back to the year 1812 and visit Harpswell. It's a beautiful day here in late April of 1812. It's an exciting time for this young country called America. Fortunes are being made all the time. Here in Maine, two young men, Charles Jose and George Leverett of Portland, are riding Middle Road to Yarmouth. The two childhood friends are loading up with their family's money and heading to Freeport. Their plan is to commission a full-rigged ship for the West Indian trade. They're chasing their fortune with plans to take salt cod, pine boards, and barrel staves to the southern islands and bring back molasses, rum, coffee, and sugar for sale up north. It's about noon when the two young men reach the inn at South Freeport. It's here they plan to take a break and eat their dinner before heading to the shipyard to negotiate their ship purchase. Dinner is served by the innkeeper's daughter a young woman named Sarah Soul. She's beautiful and full of all the charm an innkeeper needs to keep customers coming back. Charles and George are both smitten. Neither has ever seen a more beautiful woman. With dinner finished, George Leverett is ready to make his way down to the shipyard. But Charles Jose claims he isn't feeling well. He'll need to stay behind and rest. Leverett agrees and heads down without Jose. Meanwhile, Jose feels fine. He's just desperate for some alone time with the beautiful young Sarah. He tries to woo the young woman, but she makes it clear that she's not attracted to men of Spanish descent. She likes Englishmen. Jose is heartbroken, but falling in love was not why he came here in the first place. 
Soon, Leverett returns to the inn and explains he's struck a deal, that the keel of their new ship will be laid within a couple of days. As he explains the details to his partner, Jose, he catches Sarah smiling at him from across the room. That's when Leverett proposes they name this new ship Sarah, after the beautiful innkeeper's daughter. Jose doesn't love the idea of naming the ship Sarah, but he agrees because he doesn't want to look bitter. With the ship construction underway, the pair head back to Portland, but they argue almost the entire journey. Charles Jose is seething with jealousy. Once on the bridge in Yarmouth, Jose tries to force Leverett's horse over the side to the Royal River below. Thankfully, Leverett keeps his balance. By the time they reach Portland, Charles Jose quietly disappears from town. He walks away from his old life completely. It's now the autumn of 1813. Leverett's new ship, the Sarah, is now complete and ready for launch. Even better for Leverett, he proposed marriage to Sarah's soul and she accepted. Not only will they be christening a new ship, but a new marriage as well. While the ship launch goes according to plan, the wedding does not. No, the plan is for the couple to be wed in Freeport's first church. But as the guests began to arrive, it's clear the church isn't big enough to hold everyone. As a quick fix, the couple decide to hold the wedding at the shipyard. Decorations and evergreens are quickly brought down to dress up the place. Now, to the older folks in town, this is a very bad idea. It's bad luck to change the wedding venue. It does not bode well for the future of the young couple. Even the clergyman who was supposed to officiate the wedding, he bows out. He wants no part of this unlucky move. Still, the show must go on. A new clergyman is brought in from Yarmouth, which delays the wedding even further. Still, the wedding finally happens, and the couple start their life together. The Sarah is ready to sail, but Captain Leverett is having trouble finding a crew. Word spread that the captain and the ship may be unlucky born under a bad sign. Only five Freeport men sign on. The rest of the crew are recruited from Portland, but most of them come from nearby Harpswell. With the Sarah ready to sail, a strange foreign bark painted black sails into Jarius Point near the mouth of the Kennebec River. She flies no colors. Some of the vessels in the region assume they're smugglers. They ask no questions. Just as the Sarah arrives in Freeport Harbor to load her cargo, this strange black ship sails boldly into the harbor for all to see. <gasps> the strange black ship is called the Don Pedro Salazar. Unbeknownst to Captain Leverett, the ship's captain is none other than Charles Jose. <gasps> you mean the same Captain George Leverett's childhood friend turned foe, that Charles Jose? The same. Now, some locals in town learned that when Charles Jose left Portland, he sailed for Cuba where he purchased the wrecked Don Pedro Salazar, had the ship fixed up, and crewed her with some tough-as-nails Cuban sailors. He had come to Portland to secure an American registry for his ship. This is not an unusual practice for a new ship, which would explain why the ship flew no flag. With the legal formalities complete and her cargo sold off, the Don Pedro Salazar sails out of port and lays low near the wooded Mark Island. There they wait until they spot the Sarah under full sail. With no colors flying, the Don Pedro Salazar follows the Sarah just out of cannon range. The Sarah continues her journey south to the Bahamas, all the while being shadowed by this strange black ship. It's making Captain Leverett nervous. He suspects pirates, so he alters course for Nassau and the British Admiralty. Captain Jose sees the course change and immediately figures out what the Sarah is up to. With no time to waste, Captain Jose orders the Jolly Roger flag hoisted. And with top speed, the Don Pedro Salazar bears down on the Sarah. With cannons blazing, the Don Pedro Salazar pulls up alongside the Sarah so the buccaneers can board and loot the defenseless ship. Within moments, all aboard the Sarah are dead, except Captain George Leverett, who stands stoic at the ship's wheel as the pirates and his former childhood friend close in. Meanwhile, over a thousand miles to the north, Captain Leverett's bride is eating breakfast with her mother in Freeport, Maine. Suddenly, two crimson drops on the back of her hand catch Sarah's attention. Ah! Sarah is certain the drops of blood are a sign that her new husband has just been killed. Her mother assures her that she must have pricked her hand. She wipes the blood away and finds no break in the skin. Moments later, four more drops of blood appear. 
Sarah faints. Meanwhile, back on the Sarah, the pirates offer Captain Leverett a fate worse than death. They tie him to the foot of the main mast. They set the helm and tie it up with a rope. They raise a sail, then return to the Don Pedro Salazar, leaving the Sarah to sail off into open ocean with only her incapacitated captain aboard and her crew dead. Just as the Sarah sails out of sight of the Salazar, something incredible happens. The ghosts of the Sarah's slain crew rise up and get to their posts. They correct the ship's course and sail her north towards the port they know best, Potts Harbor in Harpswell, Maine. For days, the ship sails north until it reaches the Harpswell Harbor. The harbor pilot sees the Sarah and word quickly spreads that the crew had brought her home. The pilot hails the Sarah, but the ship ignores him. Now these shoals are tricky. The pilot knows every rock beneath the surface, yet he stares in awe as the crew navigates the harbor like experts without hardly slowing down. When the ship reaches Potts Harbor, it glides to a stop near shore, but no anchor is dropped. Just a single lifeboat is lowered carrying Captain Leverett. The lifeboat rows to shore. The gravely ill Captain Leverett is laid on the grass with his logbook, and the lifeboat returns to the ship just as the thick fog rolls in, then rolls away. When the fog dissipates, the Sarah is nowhere to be seen. The last item in the captain's logbook is his new heading for Nassau. Captain Leverett eventually recovers to tell the tale, and he's reunited with his bride. But no one in Harpswell can ever forget the Sarah and the ghostly crew that brought their captain back to Maine. Plus, this is not the end of the Sarah. For years, the ghostly ship is spotted in and around Harpswell's shores. Whenever the ship is seen from shore, it means someone in Harpswell is doomed. The ship is a harbinger. Everyone around these waters knows the story, and they know what it means to see the ship. Just a few decades later, John Greenleaf Whittier immortalizes the story in his poem, The Dead Ship of Harpswell. From gray sea fog, from icy drift, from peril, and from pain, the homebound fisher greets thy lights, O hundred harbored main. But many a keel shall seaward turn, and many a sail outstand, when tall and white the dead ship looms against the dusk of land. In vain o'er harp's well neck the star of evening guides her in. In vain for her the lamps are lit within thy tower, Seguin. In vain the harbor boat shall hail, in vain the pilot call. No hand shall reef her spectral sail, or let her anchor fall. Shake, brown old wives, with dreary joy, your gray head hints of ill. And, over sea beds whispering low, your prophecies fulfill. Some home amid yon birchen trees shall drape its door with woe. And slowly, where the dead ship sails, the burial boat shall row. And men shall sigh, and women weep, whose dear ones pale and pine. And sadly, over sunset seas, await the ghostly sign. They know not that its sails are filled by pity's tender breath nor see the angel at the helm who steers the ship of death. And that brings us back to today. Between the story and the poem, the ghost ship sailed into legend. We should point out that there are variations on the backstory of this one. Some believe the ghost ship was the Dash, built in Freeport for Seward and Samuel of Portland. But the end result is the same. When the ghost ship sails into Potts Harbor and around Harpswell, it means death for some local resident. Now, most of what we know about the details of the version we shared came from the October 29th, 1960 Lewiston Journal newspaper. That and an eerie John Greenleaf Whittier poem. We're always looking for some kind of sign of trouble, aren't we? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I mean, we're looking for any kind of warning that there's trouble ahead, even if it doesn't make sense, and even if there's not necessarily any connection. Oh, so like Groundhog Day, if the groundhog sees a shadow, it means a long winter. Exactly. And if you see a ghostly ship near Harpswell... It means a local isn't long for this world, which means the only way we can be safe here today is if we leave. That's true, but don't you leave us just yet because we've arrived at After the Legend, where we take a deeper dive into this week's story and sometimes veer off course. After the Legend is brought to you by our Patreon patrons, 
Our patrons are the best. They are. They support us in everything we do and help us with all of our costs associated with bringing you two stories each week. Plus, they get early ad-free access to new episodes, plus bonus episodes and content that no one else gets to hear. It's just three bucks per month, and it goes a long way in helping us. To sign up, head over to patreon.com slash New England Legends. And to see some pictures of Harpswell, Maine, and to read the entire John Greenleaf Whittier poem, you only heard a little bit of it, click on the link in our episode description or go to our website and click on episode 331. Love a good ghost ship story. We've, I think we've done five or six now. Really? Is that too much? No. Should we slow down? Out of 330 something episodes, <laughs> uh, mathematically, that's not a whole and lot. And there's probably so more stories to tell. Oh, so yeah. much more. Yeah. We, we can't, so John Greenleaf Whittier, I don't know how many times we've uh, used a poem of his over the years. I would, I'm guessing this maybe the third or so. The name has come up often. He was the Ray and Jeff of his time. <laughs> yeah, in, there you in go. Poet form. Yeah, sure. Right? Like so many of his poems, look him up. It's all public domain. You can find just about all of them online. Um, all eerie, spooky stuff about strange, you know, mm. New England legends as as poems, and uh, he's great. I mean, you you heard the great Michael Leggy read him this week in in our story, but there's so many good spooky poems that uh, he's written. Maybe that's a side uh, show that we could do. <laughs> Since it's public domain, we could just read his poems. We could hauntingly. We could we give With him sound credit, of course. And yeah. Well, we don't have to. It's public domain. <laughs> Like Mickey Mouse. Yeah. I'll well, tell you the story yeah, about Steamboat, 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 Steamboat Willie. Willie. Yeah. Right, right. There's a horror movie coming out, by the way. I, I, I think they already made it, knowing that it was uh, you know, the, lapsing. The trailer was released on January 1st. It which does is, not look good at all. Who cares? <laughs> which is the day that Steamboat <laughs> yeah. Willie went into the public domain. Yes, they were. that gun was locked and loaded and ready for, uh, <laughs> for the new year. Jack is a very big fan of Steamboat Jack, Willie. Jack, your son, yeah. Yeah. Uh, love Steamboat Willie. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. Like, not Mickey Mouse. Likes Mickey Mouse, but it's really the origins that he's fascinated by. So to see a horror movie coming out, he was very disappointed with that. So the thing, the interesting thing is, now Disney must have known that this was going to be in the public domain forever and ever. Um, but for the last bunch of years, they've been using Steamboat Willie in the very beginning of their movies. Yes. You, you see, right? Yep. Like, which I can do. I can even do the whistle because <laughs> all public domain now. Sure. And and you see him, you know, uh, steering the boat. But anyway, uh, steering the boat. Yes, which right back to it. Brings us right back to uh, <laughs> to, of course, this uh, this phantom ship in Harpswell, Maine. Uh, if you look at a map of Harpswell, Maine, it is just all coast. It's yep. a peninsula. It's thirty islands, as we said, and it's just um, live and die by the sea kind of place in sure. Maine. I'm sure, absolutely stunning in the summer and on a cold winter day. Not not the place you probably want to be. Right? right, pretty pretty tough winters and weather. Probably also easy to see phantom quote unquote phantom ships on the horizon. All kinds of things. If it's foggy out yeah. or whatnot, I'm you know I'd be surprised. I, I mean I, I'd be interested to see or know at what time of the day did these people see these ships? Right, early morning, right at dusk, with right. the fog, with the weather. Maybe not a bright sunny day. So I'm always curious about harbinger stories Mm. and if you're a paranormal fan you've probably heard of mothman in in west virginia so when he was seen the the bridge collapsed in town killed some people right and very quickly everybody made a connection that when this mothman is seen something bad happens and we're in danger it's he's a harbinger of doom Mm. there's not necessarily any connection whatsoever it could have just been like hey i'm gonna make an appearance in town and oh crap i'm sorry your bridge collapsed nothing to do with me right like i wasn't anywhere near it you know like it's it's but um but we look for connections all the time so you see the ship the ghost ship on the harbor and you're like oh old man jones is really sick lately right Uh, never mind the fact that he's 98 years old right right, yeah (laughs) and then the next day he dies and you go oh can you believe that i just saw the ship i saw the ship yeah he died and old man jones died so Sometimes a harbinger is just a connection we make, you know. Um, but we find we look for those connections. The most famous ghost ship in the world, right? The Cape of Good Hope in, in uh, South Africa is the um, the Flying Dutchman, right? Oh yeah. And so uh, I think the rule was if you saw the Flying Dutchman, it was bad luck. That's okay. that's not great. But the worst of the worst is if you if if it hails you and you pull up to it and you take mail from the Flying Dutchman. That's um, a lot. Well, right, especially today. <laughs> like, you're like, what's this you mail? <laughs> three masted. Yeah, what's mail? What's a three masted <laughs> schooner doing? Yeah. So, but if you take its mail, you're do- you're doomed. Your ship is sinking. You're going to die. Well, I don't think. Yeah. It, what did it look like? I mean, from pictures that you've seen, Flying is it, Dutchman. Yeah. Is it something haunting? Is it? I don't know. Did you've it look seen scary? Pirates of the Caribbean. I have you've seen a ship. But I mean, did it look like any other ship? 
Well, that's, I don't know. I mean, so back then, that's the other thing, right? They That's what ships looked like. But I might so. roll up on a friendly looking ship that's a little colorful. Yeah. But if it's like, if it's the only fog in the area is around this ship and it's black and dark and, and yeah. you know. And Johnny Depp's on board. And Johnny, right. I right. might stay away from it. Yeah. I'll be like, oh, go, go grab some mail from this ship. And the it looks like a safe it, ship. They all turn into skeletons. Yeah. We know. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to stay away. So if you are a captain of a ship or, or helming yes. a ship and you decide to do that, that's on you. That's your <laughs> right. fault. You should know better than to approach weird ships. <laughs> Captain, they want us to take their mail. Take their mail? No. <laughs> right. No, just, you know what? Just, you don't take mail from strangers. Just we know that. We <laughs> floor it. You know, we're getting out of here. Yeah, uh, it used to be don't take candy. I mean, it is now don't take candy from strangers. Right. But it used to be don't take mail from strangers. Well, yeah, Did you know that? Fun fact about history. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> especially from a ship. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we look for these harbingers, and, and I get it. That's some tough living in that part of the, the country. Of course, easier now. We've gotten a little soft over the years with our... Yeah central heat and stuff but um but definitely a um a, a, a great callback and a haunting poem you know truly go to our website it's all there it, you only heard about a third of it um mm. in the story read the whole thing it's just it's all laid out there it's very spooky now if you haven't subscribed to our podcast please do it right now it's free and we don't want you to miss a thing. We're building a community of odd loving weirdos here and we'd love for you to be more involved. Email us anytime through our website, join our super secret New England legend Facebook group or stop us on the street and tell us about your strange local legend. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you to Michael Leggy for lending his voice acting talent this week. Thank you to our sponsors and of course our Patreon patrons and our theme music is by John Judd. Until next time, remember, the bazaar is closer than you think. <laughs>